Now, obviously, I believe that 2023 is the up year. It's the year of up. God's trying to take us higher. Yes. Now, all of you look at that differently. What does higher mean to you? If you're here today and you're maybe, uh, you know, in your twilight years, maybe, you know, a little older, then maybe high up means different for you than somebody who's here that is, uh, you know, 18, 19 years old or whatever. And or, uh, it's just different. What is up in your life? Up can mean spiritually up. Uh, it can mean in your ministry you're going to step up. It can mean in your faith you're going to step up. It can mean in an addiction that you're going to overcome, not let it beat you down anymore. You're going to go up in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Okay, so up means a lot of different things to a lot of people. But I believe that as a church, there is an, an anointing and something God's trying to do this year where we're going up. And until the last... Last week and this Sunday, we'd even been going up in our attendance. Uh, obviously, last Sunday night, we had a full house with our concert. Uh, and then, of course, Easter was the week before. And obviously, it was full. And the week for that, we were pretty full. But you know what? It's, so, it's good. God has taken us up. He's taken us up in our, in, our, in our ability to influence the city and the county. And God has taken us up in our ministries at this church. God is taking us up. Amen. And so I believe that. I believe uh, uh, 2023 is the up year. And so uh, I, I've been dealing with uh, the keys to living the up life. And, and what are the keys to that? I, I don't think it's something that's just going to just happen. You can sit around, be lazy, and not focus and pray and spend time with God. And then you're just going to go up. I don't think that's the case. I believe that God is going to be calling you up in your discipline, up in your commitment, up in your faithfulness. Why? Because those things produce a new and a different life. And so I've been teaching on the basics that we believe here at Great Life Church, and that is the ABCs to spiritual maturity. The ABCs to spiritual maturity. And, you know, it's something that, uh, you know, I've told you that, that God has given me throughout my life. As you know, I preached my first sermon at 12, you know, all about those things, but... But the point is that as I pastored my first church at 24, I had a lot of seniors, not in that church, but in the next church I pastored, I had a lot of seniors when I started there. I was just 30 years old, 29 when I went there, and 30 uh, and when I started pastoring and uh, that church. And there were a lot of older people there and people that have been saved for 20, 30, 40 years. I mean, and I wanted to learn. I want what, to, what are the, what are the things you do in your life that has allowed you to continually serve God without all this up and down, you know, in and out, saved for a year, out for two, in for one, up for three. You know what I mean, right? Well, I want to know what is this, what is this things you do in your daily habits, your daily time with God? What do you do uh, in your life? And so the Lord started revealing these ABCs. Now, I've heard other preachers, they have their own. I mean, some of them have the seven habits and, and others do other things and so on and so forth. I've heard other pastors, you know, I coach pastors and train them. And so I've dealt with a lot of pastors. But me, I like this. The ABC is the spiritual maturity. So, and it's something I want every person mm -hmm. to know here. There are seven things that if you do in your life that I believe it will create, you create the spiritual maturity you need to be able to become all that God plans for you to be. Amen? And we've been, so I talk about those are the keys to living the spiritual, the, uh, to living the up life, right? Uh, those are obviously, uh, I'm going to say them really fast. I think, oh, you, normally they have them up there. I, do, I don't know if you have that. Uh, there, there it is. Okay. So A is attend uh, church regularly. Uh, I believe you ought to have put, you know, you ought to be in God's house. I believe that. The Bible says, to forsake not the assembly of thyself together, even so much more as the day gets here. So in other words, as it gets closer to Jesus' return, we're supposed to go to church more than less. And how many know most people go to church less nowadays than they used to? Yeah. I mean, when I was young, I went to church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Tuesday and Thursday, and any other time my parents dragged me. But anyway, so, um, you know, I went to church all the time, right? And that was good. I liked it. I liked church. It was okay. My parents made it great. So, Anyway, but B is be a friend of the lost. I believe Jesus came to seek and save the lost. That's what he came for. That was his purpose. He left heaven to come, give us life, and life more abundantly. Amen? So we need to be a friend of the lost, just like he is. He went out and he came out with the lost. And uh, we know that. C is connect with believers regularly. We believe in life groups and those kind of things because we, and we need to be in friends in the church and having friends in the church and, and having dinner and breakfast or lunch or whatever or coffee or whatever you can do. But just spend time with them. Go to the beach and those kind of things, but hang out. D, daily time with God. 
I believe this is a first or second most important thing. The first one, attend church regularly and daily time with God, I believe are vital to your spiritual growth. You get the milk of the word when you come hear me preach. Uh, preaching is I have chewed up the word and now I uh, uh, give it to you. I spend hours studying and praying and I chew it up and I digest it for myself and then it comes as milk to you, right? I cannot tell you everything that I have learned Believe me about, uh, you know, the Bible. You guys wouldn't stay long enough. I preached too long when I just preached the milk of the word. Amen. Now we try to go deep. I'm not saying that. I'm saying we try to go deep and give you nuggets so you can go deeper. But it's your responsibility to move to the meat. Amen. Can I hear an amen? Amen. amen. <laughs> okay. So I encourage you, get in the meat. The meat comes through your daily time with God. Your own notes you take. Your own reading. Your own writing. Your own studying. Your own preparation. Um, you need to do that. You need to have daily time with God. Prayer and his word and fasting. These things are important. Daily time with God. The E stands for every Christian a minister. You need to have a ministry. God called you to have a ministry. God gave you something you're supposed to do. And when you don't do it, it ain't getting done. And when it ain't getting done, there's a weak link in the church. We don't need a weak link in this church or in the church of Jesus Christ. Amen. God has brought to grant. I cannot believe as small as we are, the quality of people that God's brought to this church. It's amazing to me. And you know that's spoken from someone who's pastored a church that was very large. I know what it is when you have quality people. And I'm telling you, God has brought quality people to this church. People that have gifts and talents. You know what I mean? Kayla. God brought Kayla to this church. Hi, Kayla. And Kayla's a part of us. And we're grateful. Glad that Angel hooked up with her and brought her here. Amen. No, I mean... Not in a bad way. When I say hooked up, I mean, I, you know what, I'm old. I say the wrong word sometimes. I mean, I'm glad they, you know, became friends. Anyway, I didn't mean, oh, I'm bummed out now. <laughs> they, they are like that, not in the new sense of, you know, hooked up. I, I'm talking about in the sense of, oh, well, never mind. All right. <laughs> I mean, am I red yet? Anyway, but they're friends and they're glad Kayla's here. But Kayla has, uh, uh, has a gift for, for uh, uh, you know, uh, Instagram and publicity and marketing at, at a level. And she's promoted herself. She's a model. And she's done those things. And, and you know what? We appreciate you. I hope I'm not embarrassing you. But the point is that God brought her here. And uh, we believe God is, 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 is she's given her heart to Christ and made commitments to Christ and new commitments, even though she knew about God and all those things. But she's going deeper with God so she can go higher with God. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. We feel like, God, you're a gift to this church. We just want you to know that. Amen. 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 We appreciate young people because we need to know the new stuff so we make fools of ourselves. Anyway, but the, the thing is that, that uh, every, every Christian has a ministry, and I believe that. And uh, some people, when they're new and young in the Lord, they're... There's someone who, you know, can help us greet because they can smile because they're full of love of Jesus and the, ha and the joy of the Lord. And so we, we, we want to offer you opportunity to get involved. And you should see Pastor Donnie if you want to get involved with something like that. Or Pastor Gene if you want to get involved in, in, in like a deeper ministry. Or you, I should say a ministry that takes being a little more knowledgeable in God's word and a longer relationship. He has opportunities for you to do that. And uh, so, but the thing is that every Christian is a minister. I taught about that a couple weeks ago. And then F is focus on the fruits of the spirit. And then finally, uh, giving as a lifestyle. So today we're dealing with focus on fruits of the spirit in this part two, because it was way too big. I tried to handle it last week, but after the sermon was 40 minutes, I decided I didn't need to do that anymore. And I know that I've had a big, long intro here, but I wanted you to understand these things and make sure you get them. That's how important to me. They're important enough to take 10 minutes to deal with them again. And, and if you, when you guys can, I can just point at someone and you can quote them without them being on the screen, then we'll move on. But anyway, so uh, it's important. I, I think that when you're struggling, and I know sometimes I'm struggling, and how many, I, I sometimes don't want to do what I'm supposed to do because I'm struggling uh, emotionally. I'm feeling down, depressed, you know what I mean, and, or I'm upset or, or something bad going on, and I just don't feel like doing what I'm supposed to do. But I know because of my experience and seeing other, I have a pastor gets a bird's eye view and gets to see a lot of people's lives. And, and I see the people who give up and don't do what they need to do, then how their life slides way back. And then they have to start over or start lower anyway and restart. But, but I watch the people who say, no, I'm going to do the right thing through the 
difficult time. I'm going to do the right thing. And, and when I do the right thing, if I'm not weary in doing the right thing in due season, I shall reap if I don't quit. Amen? Amen. Amen. I know that's Bob's version, but I can quote the real one too. But the point I'm trying to make is that that God wants you to know these things in and, and, and your life. And uh, you know what? And that's important. So have daily time with God when you don't feel like it. I get up, I'm tired, haven't had my coffee yet, maybe I don't want to do that, I read the Bible, I fall asleep, right? I mean, come on, we all have these issues, but we still do what God's called us to do, to become the man and woman of God that God wants us to be. All right? So these are very important. But today we're going to deal with fruits of the Spirit, and we're mainly, uh, last week we mainly dealt with uh, the opening of it, uh, and we talked about the things, why, did, why do I believe focusing on the fruits of the Spirit is so important? I know a lot of you might have wanted me to put the gifts of the Spirit instead of the fruits of the Spirit, right? People are excited about the gifts of the Spirit. Well, the gifts of the Spirit are important. But the gifts of the Spirit, I believe, are actually secondary to the fruits in the sense that you get saved first. And when you get saved and connected to the vine, then the fruit naturally comes out of you as the DNA of being a born-again Christian. Right? It's the fruit in your life. So why do I believe that I needed to add this into the ABCs as this one of the seven most important things a believer or a Christian should be doing? And why should we focus on them? Number one, I already shared with the last week, is it's a gauge for us about how our connection to the Holy Spirit, to God the Father and God the Son, are going, right? How is our connection with God? If, if you are a person that doesn't have the fruit, the fruit of the Spirit or the fruits in your life, then that tells you there's a problem. There's a gauge. Now, it doesn't mean you're not saved. It doesn't mean you're not blessed by God. It means there's something that needs to be dealt with. It doesn't mean you're a horrible human being, lower than dirt, and you deserve to be stepped on. That's not what God's trying to say, right? Even though it is pretty rough how he handles it about producing no fruit. <laughs> he talks about cutting it off, you know, and, you know, there is issues there, okay? And I do believe that, you know, if there's no fruit, then you probably ought to get saved. Hallelujah, amen? And uh, you ought to surrender to God. But if you've been saved and you're struggling sometimes in your life in a one or two or three of the areas, that's okay. It's good to see where you're at. It's a gauge of how you're doing. And if you're struggling uh, with being loving to people or showing love, you know what, then you need to say, what's wrong? Why am I not have the fruit of the spirit of, uh, of love? Why don't I have that? You need to think about it, pray about it, study about it, talk to a pastoral staff or a, or, or, or a, a believer that you, you trust and, and deal with it. Don't just let 20 years go by and then go, well, that's just who I am. I just, I'm just that way. You know what I mean? No, God can change even the things that were part of your culture, a part of your physical DNA because of who you were raised by. God can change every bit of that in a moment because God's powerful enough to do that. Amen. Amen. But you got to want it. It starts with you wanting it. God don't force himself on no one. God don't make us show forth the fruits of the spirit. I don't even think it's something that magically happens because you get saved. I just believe it's possible and easier because you're saved. Does that make sense? See, because God don't force you to show love. He don't force you. He, he, he makes it possible and easier. A non-believer has a hard time even showing the God they real love. Right? So it, it was about, number one, I talked to you about that. And that it's a gauge. That's why I put it in. Number two, I put it in because it's a witness to unbelievers that you are different. It's a witness that you are different. When they see you, you're different. You don't handle things the same way. Because you don't handle them according to the flesh. And the two lists that are given in Galatians chapter 5, the one list in verses, uh, uh, starting in verse 16. Let's read that. Uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Uh, it says, I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh for the blood for the flesh lust against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh and they are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish but if you were but if you are led by the spirit you are under the law now the works of the flesh are evident 
as such. Adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentiousness, jealousy, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissension, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness. Uh, that's a bad list, ain't it? <laughs> that's a tough list. And the point is that he's saying that the, the, the fruit that comes out of a non-believer is fruit of envy. And so, and the fruit that comes out of a non-believer is anger. Uh, a fruit out of a fleshly person is jealousy. The fruit of being that kind of a person is what comes out of you. So, if more jealousy is coming out of you, more envy is coming out of you, more hatred is coming out of you, more anger is coming out of you, and if you want to murder somebody, you ought to stop and think about it twice. How many believe that? <laughs> Now, I believe you should think about it even if you're envy or angry or strive for not forgiving people. Is the Bible makes that very serious, too. The Bible says if you don't forgive other people then you're their trespasses, then he will not forgive you your trespasses. So it's important to deal with this stuff. So my point is to you today is that God's trying to take us up. Going up is not easy. Just like you spoke to your children and you sit them down and you go, listen, getting somewhere in this life, it takes work. It takes discipline. It takes making right decisions. You gotta, you gotta work hard. You gotta have a good attitude. You gotta treat people like you want to be treated. You need to get out there and work. You gotta get up when you don't want to get up. You gotta work hard when you don't want to work hard. And, and then you gotta have a good attitude all along, right? You tell them to go up, up in their attitude, up in their work habit, well, up, up, right? Is that true? Your father is telling you the same thing. Your, your, your spiritual father, and, 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 and through the word of God and the teaching here in Galatians, Paul, you're wanting, you, you need to go up. So it's okay if you're not up there yet. Don't take condemnation. Oh, pastor thinks I'm so horrible and I'm condemning myself. I'm not preaching a condemning word. I'm telling you, I want you to know if you're walking in the flesh or you're walking in the spirit. And your fruit, if you'll you'll actually open your eyes and you'll actually be brutally honest with yourself. How many know that people lie to themselves and see what they want to see? Yeah. Yep. I do. When I look in the more mirror, man, I see a buff, cool looking dude, man. <laughs> I see a guy that if I flex my muscles right now, I'd rip my shirt, right? So I'm really careful about it, right? You know, I mean, we see and we lie to ourselves sometimes, you know, and, and I lie to myself and I know good and well it's because I'm, I'm undisciplined and I'm slothful and I don't work out and I eat whatever I want. And therefore I know, yeah, I got the, the diabetes, which makes it hard, you know, how you store fat and I've got it all figured out. I can tell people I'm not that undisciplined, you know, it's just, it, it makes me store it differently than other people. And uh, you can see that. But the point is that. That it, it, you know, I can, I can, I can see the truth, or I can tell myself things that aren't true that I see in the mirror, like the message I preached a few weeks ago. Uh, you know, change your mirror, but, but I want you to change your mirror. I don't want to see myself. I'm not seeing myself or putting myself down, but I need to be real with myself, Amen. to be honest with myself. The fruit of the spirit of love is not in my life. Therefore, I need to deal with it. Maybe love is in my life 70% of my time, but there's certain kind of people, certain situations, people that do these certain things, especially when I'm driving, I don't love them. Now, that's not my problem. I don't have a problem with people when I drive. Well, maybe sometimes, but not usually. But the thing is, you may. I don't know. But you know what? Deal with it. There's no reason to yell and scream at everybody on the road. They can't hear it anyway. You're exactly right. That's what, how old are you? No, I can't ask, can I? But anyway, she's like 50, so she knows. Oh, love you. <laughs> Let's take another offering. Anyway, um, no, but, <laughs> no, but the, the thing is that, that we got to know. we got to know we got to be honest with ourselves. And if you'll be honest with yourself, you'll have a great life. I know. I, I tried to plan a lot of good stuff in my life. Did I plan bad? Yes, I did. But I tried to plan good stuff in my life all of my life from a teenager. I don't have those stories that a lot of teenagers have. And I always hated it because I didn't have a real testimony like, I, you know, got drugs, got my girlfriend pregnant. You know, I didn't have those kind of great testimonies. I had the testimony that I served God all my life. None of that stuff ever happened to me. And I don't know nothing about nothing. <laughs> 
You know what I mean? And, and I always felt bad about it, but God showed me. He saved me from getting involved in any of that junk. Amen? Amen. Amen. And I'm grateful for that testimony. Now, I went through my own junk. All of you know that I've been divorced. It's not fun. That's the worst thing that ever happened in your life. I tried not to. I tried to control it. I tried to make it not happen. You all know the story. But the point is it happened in my life. And it knocked me out. For many, for many years as I went through the process of trying to restore that for three and then on to, you know, getting remarried and then going through the whole process with the church of, of restoration and all those things. It was almost a decade process. Ten years. But you know what? It was worth it to me to go through it. I believe pastors should be held to higher standard. And I believe a pastor thing, if they did things, which I didn't necessarily, uh, they found that I was a workaholic and I was gone and done too much. And that is true. I was. And I'm a better husband and a better father. And I'm a better pastor. And I believe I'm a better Christian. Amen? Amen. See, because you got to let your life, you know, things that happen and stuff that happens, you got to let it do what God wants to do in your life and move up to where God wants you to be. Amen? Pastor in a church of... A huge, big church, all that stuff. But it didn't matter. It don't matter ultimately because, you know what? Something else happened and, and, and God allowed it and I allowed it and, and it happened. And, and I had to start over again and God has rebuilt me and I am grateful for his blessings. He takes bad and turns it around for good. Amen. 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 I usually don't talk about this when I can't explain the whole story because now people are like, what in the world? What's wrong with this guy? But the, the point I, I normally want, to, but I ain't got time to explain all that. So what we're going to say is that, that, that I was trying to explain to you was I'm not trying to tell you that I am perfect. That's why I told you that. But at the same time, I'm telling you that if you will surrender to God, submit to him. And if you will resist the devil, he will flee. And I believe that your greater, your latter days can be greater than your former. Amen. Amen. And he'll take all that bad and turn it around for good. I don't know why I'm getting stuck here so long. But the point that I want to make completely with you is that. You are a witness to unbelievers that all that stuff can be going on in your life. But yet, you still love God. You still trust God. You still have joy. You still have peace. You still have hope. You still are faithful. Right? And that's different than the world. I believe one of the most powerful attractions to sinners is seeing that you're different and you've got joy and peace. I teach on soul winning. You know that. That's what my book's written on. And, and I believe in soul winning to the depth of who I am. And I believe that's the reason we exist is the people saved and discipled, right? And so, so uh, I believe that. And when I've looked at it, God has revealed. And, and, and in reality, he changed the book I'm writing now in, in ways because I am going to use the fruits of the spirit. Because I believe the, when you have the fruit of the spirit in your life, it is a natural power that draws people to want what you have. Yes. You don't have to necessarily learn the four spiritual laws, even though I encourage you to. But you don't have to learn those or the ABCs, the salvation, the road, the Romans road. You don't have to learn all this, even though I want you to. But, but you, you at least need to be Jesus with skin on. In other words, you need to have Jesus inside of you and allow his fruit to come out of you so you look like him and you look like somebody that knows him at least and somebody who's close to him and somebody that's been set free from the old fleshly man. Tell your neighbor, that's good. <laughs> All right, then, let's move on. So today I'm going to deal a little more with the passage says if you are connected to Jesus... Uh, you will produce, and if you're connected to the vine, in John chapter 15, if you want to turn there, in John chapter 15, verses 4 through 5, uh, we, we taught on this a couple of months ago, and so I'm not going to deal with it a lot, but it said, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. That's why I believe it's hard for a person that is not abiding in Jesus, right? Somebody's not saved, it's hard for them to have the fruits of the Spirit for real. They can force themselves to do it, but it helps you to do it 
if you are connected to the vine. Unless you abide in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. He's Jesus, I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides or is connected in me and I in him. So it's a multi-ingrained, uh, a, a grafted in together. And it says, and I in him, you will bear much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. So you can have either nothing or bunches. You need to be connected to the vine. Amen. Amen. Powerful scripture, right? Go yeah. over and read the whole chapter. John chapter 15. It is powerful. But I read that really bad list earlier to you. But now I'm going to read that good list to you. Verse 22 of Galatians chapter 5. Verse 22. This is the fruit. This is what the DNA is. This is what will come out of you. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I know nobody likes that one. <laughs> Against such there is no law. And those who are, are Christ's have crucified the flesh, crucified the idolatry, the fornication, the remember the envy, the strife, the anger, the murdering, remember all that? Have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Amen? Amen? Amen. So I want to deal with the uh, I want to deal with the first couple of these today. Love, and I'm I'm going to speed up a little bit. But love, the first one was love. It said, but the fruit of the spirit, so the DNA in you, because you're a Christian connected to the vine, then the fruit that should be produced is love. Amen. Amen. You should love people that are unlovable. That's right. And I know sometimes maybe I'm unlovable, but you need to love me anyway. I mean, what really have you done if you love the ones that are easy to love? How special are you? I love my wife. My wife is easy to love. She's kind to me. She's helpful to me. She takes care of me. She, she's there for me when I want her to be there for me. Right? And I try to be there for her and all those things. And then and, 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 and many times when, you know, uh, she, when I'm wrong, she lets me know. And it's all a good thing. Right? You know what I'm talking about, right? Yes, we fight sometimes. We argue sometimes. When I say fight, I don't mean like. <laughs> if anyone's going to get a black eye that way, it's only going to be me. But the point is, because my mom and daddy taught me better than that. But the, the point is that, that I don't mean fight like that. I argue or disagreement or, or whatever. It happens sometimes. And, 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 and we just, we, but we still love each other. And sometimes I'm very unlovable. But she still loves me, right? And, and she loves me. The, that's, that's just normal stuff there. It's easy to love somebody that you see so wonderful and beautiful like I do my wife, right? And so that's easy. But to love other people that are mean and, uh, and talk bad to me and have bad plans for my life and try to destroy me, how many believe those are harder to love? Yeah. Yeah. The Bible says to love those who despitefully use you. It's to... Be kind to those and love those who are, 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 are planning to misuse you. That's pretty ugly stuff. Am I perfect to that? Not always. <laughs> I'd say 80% of the time I do pretty well with that. You know what I mean? I do. I do pretty well, but sometimes I have a lapse of, of, of love too. And then I try to let the Holy Spirit deal with me and help me to do better. And in time, I love a little more. I mean... You know, today, I love Pastor Gene. Tomorrow, we'll see. Anyway. <laughs> no, that's not true. Pastor Gene's easy to love. He's, he's like a brother to me. And I know he don't like when I say like a brother. You just need to say I'm a brother to you. Anyway, but uh, he's like a brother to me. You know, we've known each other since I was young. <laughs> he was kind of young. But anyway, so uh, we've known each other for... Oh, I think like almost 40 years. I'm not even sure anymore. It's getting out of, getting out of control here. But uh, so, you know, I love him. With all of his quirks and all of his stuff, I love him. He loves me, right? 
He loves me with all my quirks and weirdness, and he respects me, and I appreciate that. I respect him, right? And, 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 but, but I want you to know that, yes, there are people that need to love, but you do something special, and this kind of love is a love that loves even when people aren't worth or aren't qualified. They don't earn the right to be loved. Does that make sense? I'm trying to think of the word. I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to know those words, and I do, but I can't remember. But anyway, but those that don't deserve to be loved, right? Because of their actions, it doesn't matter. And so love is something God wants us to have. Why do I believe in kids' church of learning the scripture and knowing the Bible and singing songs that have the scripture? Because when I was young, I learned them that way. And half the scriptures I quote is because it was a song. Like 1 John 4, 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another. The love is of God and everyone loved, right? So, beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God and everyone that loveth is born of God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God. What, how does it say next? For God is love. For God is love. That's it. For God is love. <laughs> that pretty much is like, period. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, he's trying to say that God's essence of who he is is love. And we know God's a father also, and he corrects us, and, and he chastens those who he loves, right? Just because he chastens you don't mean he don't love you. My, my dad with me once in a while, but my mom, anyway, we're not going to get on my mom. She's going to come preach for us on Mother's Day, my mom. And I know I kind of I, I, I got a little rough talking about my mom, you know, running me over and correcting me and whipping me all the time. But I deserved it. Uh, but anyway, so, but no, she's a woman of God. She spoke the word into my life. She has been very, she is a woman of faith. She quotes, I forget how many scriptures, every day. In a row. You walk in the room and think she's talking to herself. She's just quoting her 50, 60, 100 verses. She quotes in a row every morning. Washing her mind and her heart. Teach me to do those things. She's got books and books and books of journals. I begged her for them. We want to type them up as a family for her. But the point is that, that she's a wonderful woman of God. And you want to be here on Mother's Day to hear her sermon. Uh, how does she raise? As a preacher sometimes don't even raise Christian kids. Let alone preacher kids. And all three of us preach the gospel. And uh, how, how does that happen? And my mom has wisdom. And when you meet her, you'll know there's something different about her. Amen? Amen. Now, she's a lot more softer and kinder than she was when I was young. But, <laughs> no, I'm teasing. <laughs> but no, 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 no. She's a lot more. She's just in her older age. She's become a less of a fireball. But she is awesome. And you will enjoy her, her message. Amen? I didn't mean that in a bad way. My mom's awesome. Anyway, um, so... Uh, you'll be hearing her. I, I asked my dad to stick around and preach a, a back to back and him to preach the next Sunday. But I don't think they're going to take me up on that because they got some other commitments. Uh, but anyway, uh, but they have resigned their church and they no longer pastor the church as of last week. So we are going to be having them a, a little more often. All right. So uh, anyway, and Pastor John took has taken over my brother. So has taken over the church. So anyway, just as a quick announcement. <laughs> but anyway, so we are. Um, and we'll be having them soon. But love is very important because God is love. Most uh, people think uh, that when you think about somebody being spiritual, uh, it, you know, it talks about, for instance, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, though. It's a very powerful chapter. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13 is the love chapter. And I would encourage you to read it and, and read it anytime you think about it. But memorize it. If you want to memorize a particular chapter in the Bible, that's a good place to start. Okay? And uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 11 and 1 Corinthians chapter 13 are very good places to start. As well as John uh, 15 that I read to you earlier. But so we've got some really good word in here today for you. But in, John, in 1 Corinthians 13, it says, Though I speak with tongues of men... And of angels, but have not love. So it's saying even if you speak in the tongues of angels, which most people see that as tongues, preaching and singing in the spirit or, or, or speaking in tongues. The point is people think, oh, wow, if you prophesy or if you give words of knowledge or if you speak in tongues, then you're, oh, you're so spiritual. People think that way sometimes or they'll think if you, uh, you know, have gift of healing, man, you must be so close to God. But God says it this way. He says, though I speak with tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass and a clanging cymbal. It's saying you're just noise. That's why I focus on the fruits of the Spirit in these lists and not necessarily gifts. Now, the gifts are important. I'm not downplaying them. 
and I'm telling it's part of your ministry maybe, but the point is the gifts and the fruit is something that should be in every Christian's life. And the fruit starts with love. Because if you don't have love and you do all this fancy stuff, it says, and though I have the gift of prophecy and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have faith, wow. He even mentions faith. I mean, if you ask people, people say, well, faith is really important, right? How many think faith is really important? <laughs> you got to have faith to, to, be, to, to get connected to the vine, <laughs> right? So faith is important. But he's trying to help us understand something. He's saying even if, you have the, even if you have the gift of faith. Now that's a different thing. The gift of faith is different than the faith it takes to get saved. The gift of faith is even beyond. I believe I operate in the gift of faith. I've seen many, many miracles. I've seen blessings of God. God's done things that way beyond what I can do in myself. He has blessed me tremendously. Amen. And I trust him. And I have faith. I have a faith for things. I can believe for things. It's beyond the gift of faith that God gave me uh, when he made me. But, and, and, and I just believe I have the gift of faith in operation. But what he's saying is even though you have the gift of faith so that I could remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. Not just noise. Now he's saying you're nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned. In other words, you are the ultimate sacrificer. Some people are like, oh, I sacrifice so much. I give my money to the poor. I go down and feed people. I don't know, if I see somebody in need, I take care of them. I always at the church. I mow the lawn, which we appreciate you mowing the lawn, uh, uh, Ben and Jay. Uh, we really appreciate that. But the point is that, that I mow the lawn. I, I clean the church. I, I, I vacuum. These things are important. Or you work as an usher or greeter or you're a, you're a pastor. You know what I mean? So the point is that even though you may do all those things and sacrifice tremendously, it's not saying it's wrong to do those things. Obviously, it's not wrong to have faith. It's what he's trying to help us understand here something is that all of those things in your life need to be connected with love. He gets so serious about it in one place in the scripture. He says that if you're not kind to those that are young in the Lord and you hurt them and make them stray away because you think, well, bless God, I'm the, I'm the keeper of the gate of, of sanctification. And, and I tell you how to be sanctified. And if you dress like that and you talk like that, you better get that dress down a little girl. You know what? You better make it longer. You know what? If you act like that to people, then you are spiritually immature and you don't have love. Amen. This isn't a church like this. This is a church that believes, yes, there are standards, but we don't believe you're the standard writer. Right? <laughs> right? We believe that God is the standard giver, and the Holy Spirit will speak to people. And if He wants me to, He will speak to me as the pastor, their spiritual father, their spiritual leader, and I will speak to them, and I do sometimes. Ask somebody. Probably ask yourself. Why? Because I love you. Pastor Gene will speak to you. I know he will. He's not scared to speak to you. He went and got a degree in counseling so that he could speak to you properly. <laughs> Pastor Donnie, he's got a degree in hard knocks. <laughs> <laughs> right? Probably a real degree, too. I really don't know. I'm not sure. But the point is that he's got a degree in hard knocks. I know that. He's, he's, he's dealt with lots of people, lots of situations. He's the most loving, kind person. He actually gives people more slack than they deserve sometimes. I'm like, Pastor Gene. I mean, Pastor, Pastor Donnie, you've got you to gotta be a little tougher on them anyway. <laughs> Anybody can share their mind and give people a piece of their mind. Oh, I'm special. I'm a straight talker. I tell it like it is. Jesus told it like it was to religious leaders. You want to tell me how it is? I'm a, I'm a, I'm a religious Christian, a religious leader. I'm not a religious Christian. I'm a religious leader. I, I'm strong. I've been saved all my life. Uh, I know God's word. You want to come tell me, Pastor Bob, you messed up. You did blah, blah, blah. You go right ahead and come tell me that. I don't have a problem with that. You might want to be ready for my answer, but I'm okay with that. All right. I've been corrected and I've actually said, you know what? You're right. And I'm sorry. But I've also said, you're misunderstanding the scripture. You're misunderstanding what's going on here. 
Okay? But the point is, I don't think you'd be wrong for doing that, coming and doing that to me. Because, but Jesus, he dealt with the religious leaders in a tough way. But the, the prostitute, he was very careful with her and very kind and actually stood in front of her and protected her. And we as Christians, it's weird how the Christians in the past have been people without the love. They speak in tongues, they heal people, they, they have faith, they have all these things. Oh, I'm so important, and I dress the part, and I wear the nice tie, and I walk the right walk, and I say the right words at the exact right moment. Therefore, I have the right to tell you, you know what, you need to turn or you're going to burn. <laughs> That's just not true. You want to you affect somebody's life that is struggling and living and doing the things they shouldn't be doing? Then take the time to build a relationship with them. Take the time to love on them. Take the time to be there for them. Take the time to show them the love of Christ. Build this bridge of relationship. And then you'll have the right to say, you know what? You know what? That dress is a little bit short. Sometimes when you're up in the front, you're kneeling down. Well, we see things we don't want to see. You might want a little, little longer dress. Right? Yeah. Amen? Amen. But the point is that I really don't think I'm, I don't in this church. Nobody's like that. I don't have to deal with that stuff. You know what I mean? But the point I'm trying to make is that we got to be careful. Anybody can see stuff and judge and oh yeah, they should do this and they should do that and they should do it this way and they don't do that way and man, I wish that youth leader would get things in order. They're just messed up and all this stuff they do. You know what I mean? Yeah. See, and, you know, be careful, Bob. You got to end this sermon here eventually. I said, I don't want to hurt them. Anyway, that's for sure. They know I'm joking. But it's true. All right. Be careful how you say things. We should hold our tongue. We should be careful. We should be kind and loving. Let the Holy Spirit deal with people a little bit. I got enough junk in my life. I'm the pastor, and it's my job sometimes to say things to people. And I'm like, God, really, do I have to do that? Please, right. no. Please, no. <laughs> Get somebody else do it here. I quit today. Let somebody else be the pastor today. And they take care of that, and then I'll take it back. How about that, God? Because that's the heart you have when you, do, when you really love people. Right. Other people say, God, I'm finally I'm a straight talker. I can tell them how I'm real. It's okay. Now, some things I mean, I have to deal with them. I know that. And I'm not saying that it's okay what they're doing. I'm not saying any of that. We don't accept sin in this church. It's not what we're saying. We'll just be loving to people, though, how we share things. So love is important. And even though, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Then it goes on to talk about love. Love, love, love. Love, love, love makes people happy. Anyway. All right. Number two, and I'm going to finish with this one, joy. Joy is important. And the joy of the Lord is your strength. You notice it doesn't say the happiness is your strength. We all know the difference between happiness and joy. Happiness is fleeting. Happiness is circumstantial. I'm happy right now because tonight I get to see my newest grandbaby. Right? Oh. Amen. And I'm excited about that. I saw her when she was born. And she had a tough birth. And the devil tried to do stuff. And we rebuked that. And, and they took her. And they got her breathing. And not choking anymore. And eventually they got back right. And eventually she got to get to hold her. I barely got to hold her before I left. After waiting a week. But I got to hold her finally. And now she's getting healthier and healthier. And she's beautiful. And I believe she will be in service with us next Sunday. I only want to see her. Amen. <laughs> I know, number six grandbaby. Hallelujah. Aww. That's your cue to say, wow, you don't look that old. But anyway, <laughs> that's my right. stuff. So, um, so, so we're excited. But so I'm I'm happy that I get to see her because the circumstances are aligning. But then I would be sad the other 50, 50 52 weeks in a year, the other 51 weeks, because I wasn't with her, if my joy was because of my circumstances. Make sense? Yeah. So my circumstances don't determine that, even though sometimes when I think about not being with any of my seven children or any of my six grandchildren, I get sad about that. But then the joy of the Lord is still in my life. 
The Bible makes it clear in John chapter 16, verse 22. John chapter 16, verse 22. And I'm reading it in a little more modern version. But it says, you have sorrow now, but your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. John 16, 22. See, no one can take your joy. You give your joy away. If you start letting people take control of your joy, then you'll never have joy. Right? I don't let other people control my joy. I am joyful because I trust the Lord. Because the joy, I have joy because I know God's going to work it all out. I have joy because I lean on Him. I have the joy of the Lord, right? Amen. So what does the joy of the Lord do? I believe it does three things. Number one, joy chases away depression. <laughs> there is no room for depression. Now, there may be sad moments. Yes, I'm sad sometimes when I think about my kids not being around. And I wish I was more, be able to be more in their life. I'm sad about that. But I'm not going to let that turn into depression that pushes out the joy of the Lord. Amen? Amen? And yes, depression tries to come into our life. Circumstance try to tell us things about it. And, and, and we move into depression. But if you have joy in there, there's not room for depression. Amen. Number two, joy helps you receive from God. I don't know about you, but when I'm upset, angry, sad, I don't know about you, but sometimes I have a hard time saying, Jesus, I believe in you. Right? Sometimes I, 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 sometimes I feel like there is just so much life trouble on top of me. And I feel like sometimes if I'm not careful, I'll find myself crawling along on the ground. And all the burdens of life are piled on top of me. And it's all I'm trying to do is survive. If I can survive one more day, if I can survive one more week, if I can survive one more year, I'll pop out on the other side. And sometimes life is just pushing us down and we feel like we're very just surviving. And I preach a message about that called moving from surviving to thriving because God doesn't want you to live in that area. And one of the ways you don't live there is to let the joy of the Lord to be your strength. To think about the goodness of God every day and in every situation. You say it comes and says, you're going to be destroyed. You're going to be nothing anymore. You're a horrible person. You messed up. He condemns you over and over over and over again and you tell him my God has forgiven me he died upon the cross for my sins when I was still yet a sinner he died for me in the world in this world the Bible you proclaim in the world in this world I'll have tribulation but I'm going to be of good cheer because Jesus has overcome everything there ain't nothing you can throw at me Satan that my father cannot destroy or root out of my life I get excited. Hallelujah. I'm both kind of preacher. You don't know which one you're going to get, what day. Yeah. <laughs> Bring them all. <laughs> Hallelujah. I feel God's spirit right here. Someone has been, been just feeling like they're underneath it all and all the junk and all the stuff. And it just keeps coming at you. Uh, fiery dart after fiery dart. Problem after problem. Challenge after challenge. But I'm here to tell you, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Believe it and stand on it in Jesus' name. come every week because it takes a while to get through this lifelong sermon anyway <laughs> so but joy number one chases away depression number two joy helps you receive from god it gives you the faith it says rejoice always pray continually rejoice always i'm not even there yet but i wish i was how many would like to live in rejoicing amen yeah. why not Not that everything's good all the time, but if you get to choose, I always tell people, you get to choose to look at everything uh, in different, from different perspectives. You can look, for, it's up to you. So somebody, somebody does something to me that hurts my feelings, which happens. Don't hurt my feelings, I'm soft and squishy inside, all right? 
No, but no, but the point is, don't don't hurt me, you know. I mean, don't speak bad about me. And I can, or I can see two people talking in the back and whispering and looking over at me, whispering, and looking over at me. And I'm like, man, they thought I preached about that. They don't like me very much. Look at they're talking about me. Or I can think, you know what? They think I'm such a good-looking, gorgeous guy. They just really <laughs> think I'm something else. You know, they're talking about how good my sermon was. I don't know what they're talking about. Why is it that we have to choose the negative? Why not choose the positive? I mean, you get to choose. My wife did that yesterday. She told me, she says, something went down. It wasn't about the church people. It was something else. Something went down. And she's like, you know what? I just chose to believe that they were doing this. And they meant this to happen. They meant it this way. Yeah. And I said, that's right. You do that, girl. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Joy is that way. Joy is if you take this scripture, it says rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you. First Thessalonians. That's a long spelling, I know. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. First Thessalonians 5, 16. Rejoice always. Amen? Joy keeps you receiving from God. In other words, when you're a joyful heart, it's easier to trust God, to believe for things, to have faith for stuff. Yeah. When you're underneath living on the bottom, it's hard to get up and get strong and say, okay, God, I know you're going to do something about this. But if you're already living in joy, it's a lot easier. Amen? Yeah. And joy keeps us healthy. Did you know that? Yeah. Joy keeps us healthy. The Proverbs chapter 17, verse 22, the book of the Bible, I wish I would have made my boys memorize, but I did not. I say my boys because I raised four boys. My wife has two girls and a boy, but we have seven children together, just so you kind of understand. So when I say I raised four boys, I didn't mean I didn't want my girls to learn Proverbs. <laughs> but, but I wish that I would have taught, I made them memorize the book of Proverbs. I, I really do. It was a huge, it's a huge disappointment in my life. I know they, they're glad I didn't think about it. But anyway... But Proverbs chapter 17, verse 22, a joyful heart is a good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. The joy of the Lord is good medicine. We wonder why so many people are sick. They have to take certain medicines. I even take high blood pressure medicines. I wonder if I could just live a little more in the joy of the Lord, maybe I wouldn't have to take that medicine. Amen? Just being honest about myself. Even though I know that, you know, my mom had it, my aunts have it, my grandma had it. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like I can say, generationally, I got it. But you know what? It don't matter. I believe God can heal me. And I also yeah. believe the joy of the Lord is my medicine. Amen? Amen. 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 All right. Just because I don't follow it doesn't mean it's not true. I do believe. Now, in other areas of my life, I believe the joy of the Lord has been a good medicine. I've allowed it to be. I'm not a depressed person, even though I could be. I went through plenty of my stuff. You all know that. I've had my junk, you know, head on collision. It took me a long time to learn how to walk again. I mean, I've been around by my mother. You know all these things, right? And the point is, there's been a lot of stuff going on in my life. But you know what? It doesn't matter. She did it on accident. But anyway, so I want to make sure it's clear. But the point is that, that, that I've been through junk. But, and, I've, and I've always been a person to look at things optimistically and believe God's got it under control. And I trust God and I have joy in the middle of junk. And God has blessed me and it's been like a medicine in my life. So in conclusion, what does joy look like? Joy doesn't complain or grumble about people or situations very often. It's not your responsibility. Why do we take on everybody? It's other people. That's why I hate what they're doing right now to parents and separating them from their children. And, and schools are trying to say they have the right to do things in their children's life when the parents who has the right and responsibility. Amen? Amen. This is wrong. And we shouldn't go for anybody that applies to that. And I'm not usually, I don't usually mention, you know, Republican or Democrat and those kind of, I don't get into that stuff normally. Now, personally, when I come to my house and I'll be talking to Bobby, <laughs> you come talk to Bobby about it, I'll tell you all day long. But I normally don't preach here about it much. And I'm not preaching about which one to vote for. I'm telling you, I believe there are certain things that we as Christians should not vote for. And people that take rights from parents and give them to the government and let them decide whether or not they should be a boy or a girl or whatever they want to decide. God decided what they would be from the beginning of time. Before they were even born, God decided, it says. Either believe the Bible or you don't. So the point is that I'm trying to make is that mostly is if you're a parent in the house, be the parent. Don't 
allow that stuff to be taught. Be the counterbalance. Teach them what the Bible says. And if you have the ability, pray God let you put them somewhere where they'll learn the right things. Amen? Amen. You have the money, but I understand it's tough. Or do what Dolores did. Teach them at home. <laughs> Not easy to do, though, right, Dolores? No. So it's a hard thing, but I'm not telling you have to do that. You can protect them other ways, and you have to decide what you do. But be the parent. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. So joy doesn't complain or grumble about people or situations. What it's trying to say is that I don't remember how I tied that in. You know, but the point I'm trying to make is that that uh, we don't want to be complaining and grumbling. Uh, uh, we need to be uh, proactive in, in in our life and and think about things positively. Joy is predictable, happy every day. And it really is. Joy can be happy every day, even in the middle of junk. I'm not saying you have to be happy every day. I'm not happy every day. I'm happy most days. But I got joy every day. But it normally leads into happiness, too. You know? But I got joy. Why? Because I believe God's going to work it out. Yeah. Even if I do get an argument with my wife. She's going to eventually figure out she was wrong, and we're going to move on. You know what I mean? <laughs> Please don't tell her I said that. Anyway, um, I did good earlier. Right? You can tell you're doing so good. No, I'm teasing. You know that. Honestly, most of the time I'm wrong. I do really know the truth of it. I know that'll give, give you much confidence as your pastor. But anyway, but you know, my my thing is that I, I even even when I get in arguments or with people or have problems, I still have joy. Joy doesn't crumble to self pity at the slightest bit of negative news. Joy talks back to difficult situations with the word of God. Amen? Amen. Joy is optimistic, not pessimistic. Joy encourages and doesn't tear down. And finally, joy is a pleasure to be around. Amen? Amen. It's kind of a poem, but I don't read poems very well. So I encourage you today to let love and joy come out of your life. Evaluate if you have love and joy. Amen? Yes. Amen? So peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control are the rest of them. And uh, we'll probably deal with some of them next time. Amen? Yes. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet. Who will pay for the clock to be put up in the back? Who will pay for the clock? I thought everybody would. we got to put a clock up, right? <laughs> I don't know what time it is, but I will tell you this. I believe that God wanted us to hear the word yes. today. Amen? Yes. Yes. And I want you to receive the word of the Lord today for what God has for you. Receive what he had for you. You are here for a reason. Receive it. Live by it. And let God do what he wants to do in your life. Amen? Amen. 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 Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. Your word is very powerful, God. And the word you shared with us today is very powerful. Lord, I pray you would apply it to our lives. That we'd want the fruit of the Spirit to be evident in our life. But specifically to have love for people. Even people that are unlovable, let us always just be loving to people. Yes. Lord, also let the joy of the Lord fill our hearts. And even in the middle of all the trouble and the tribulations, let us let the love and joy of God Fill every person here. In Jesus' holy name.